We have three opportunities every day to make a choice that benefits the planet, benefits folks that are putting their lives and their effort and their water and their labor hours. And you make a choice three times a day. I think as we like grow to to better understand the options out there and, and it can be very taste driven too, making an impact can be delicious at the end of the day. That little excerpt was from Lydia Oxley, who is the president at Renewal Mill and also our guest on today's episode. Hey there, and welcome to the Made to Sustain podcast. I'm your host, Kelly D'Amico, and I'm so excited for you to be here with me today. My conversation with Lydia today includes talking about things like the mindset shift in the food industry for including upcycled ingredients. Renewal Mill is actually one of the founding members of the Upcycled Foods Association, and we talk about some of the challenges and the opportunities in this space for other people and other members in the food industry. We're also going to talk about how Renewal Mill specifically is focusing on recovering nutritious products and ingredients to make delicious foods, baked goods, and other ingredients that they sell and promote within the food industry. We'll also talk today about how upcycling can lead to a more sustainable food system and opportunities and uniqueness of manufacturing with upcycled ingredients. So make sure you listen to today's episode with my guest Lydia from Renewal Mill to hear our fascinating conversation around upcycled foods and how they can lead to a more sustainable food system. And make sure you check out Renewal Mill's products. We'll link their website in the show notes below. And I hope you enjoy today's episode. Welcome to the Made to Sustain podcast. I'm really excited today to introduce you to my guest, Lydia Oxley from Renewal Mill. Hey, Lydia. Hello. How's it going? Going pretty good. Um, we got lovely spring weather here today in New Jersey. How about you? Nice. I'm enjoying it as well. I'm based out in New York and I have a fuzzy cat in the distance who might try and crash the party at some point. So... Those pesky pets, I've got a couple of them myself, and they always manage to get in the shot. (laughs) (laughs) They just need the love and attention. Yeah, yeah, my dog in particular always has something to say. Aw, an opinionated guy. (laughs) Well, super excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I know like the world that you are in is very vast, and I'm very excited that you've been able to select us for this, and I'm very honored to be in the midst. Yeah, yeah. I'm super glad to have you here. I mean, I love Renewal Mill, big fan of Renewal Mill. Actually brought your brownies to a work potluck once, um, and they were a huge hit. Everybody loved them. So if you haven't tried them yet, definitely, definitely highly recommend. Yay! Well, so glad to hear they were a hit. And it is always nice to bring them out to parties, especially because uh, vegans and gluten-free folks alike can enjoy. Yeah, I definitely positioned them once before as the most inclusive dessert. Oh, Uh, (laughs) that's a good way to put it. I'm going to steal that. (laughs) Yeah, go ahead. So can you tell me a little bit about you and Renewal Mill and how did you get started? Yeah, so my role at Renewal Mill is president. I came on for sales and marketing in August of last year. Renewal Mill had been in Whole Foods for almost a year at the time. Um, maybe a little bit over a year, and we're really looking to structure the CPG side of the business. So Renewal Mill started off originally as an ingredients company and moved into CPG a little bit later on. So I became obviously infatuated with Renewal Mill and came on to support the team on the consumer side and then grew in to now support a bit of our investor relations as well from the president role. Yeah, awesome. And just for our listeners, CPG is consumer packaged goods. Just want to call that out there. (laughs) But tell me about what's your favorite product at Renewal Mill and what uh, ingredients are you focused on upcycling and how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. So we have two aspects of our business. We have our ingredient side and then we have our consumer side. Now, everything goes back to what we do within upcycling. And so If you've ever had oat milk before, which a lot of folks have, um, another one is soy milk. When we create oat milk and soy milk, what we're actually doing is removing the protein and fiber that's naturally occurring in those raw ingredients. And so oats actually have a, a good amount of protein and fiber, but they don't make it into the end product of oat milk, for instance. So what we do is we take the protein and the fiber that's removed um, within the process, and we dry and mill that into a naturally gluten-free flour. 
And so we sell those flowers B2B within kind of like the ingredient sales landscape. And those have applications across cereal to tortillas to different baking mixes, breads and that kind of thing. And then we also make our own products as well, everything from baking mixes to the flowers themselves. And then also we have a line of ready-to-eat cookies as well. So they have a lot of different applications. And we're also a vegan company. Um, All of our products are gluten-free. So we also want to be inclusive for all eaters, as you mentioned. And my favorite product is probably our chocolate chip cookie mix. It is a crowd pleaser and it's made with our oat milk flour. Another reason why it's my favorite is because it's allergen friendly as well. So it's free from the top set of allergens that are floating around right now. And so that's been really, really excited to see the growth of that product. And I think the the most interesting thing about Renewal Mill and really where we position our products is that upcycled can mean elevated, which I'm sure we'll talk about a lot today. But that's kind of us in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, cool. I didn't realize you were also in the, the B2B space, but that makes a lot of sense since there is a lot of interest in this space. Yeah, it's a little bit of our origin story for sure. Yeah, awesome. And I think you're you're so right about a lot of the nutrients getting out of the um, you know, like oat milk space or like soy milk space, because that's some of the biggest complaints um, from the ingredient side that I hear is how can we get protein in there to, to make it like a nutritional parity between dairy milk and or any kind of other milk. So I think that's that's cool that you're actually making something of it because we don't want to lose that nutrition. Absolutely. I mean, you think about how a lot of folks in the health industry really talk poorly about processing food or eating processed food. That's just one example of how processing functionally works, but how it ultimately means opportunity if you're able to look at what's being processed out. So we see it as really exciting to be able to, as you mentioned, bring it back into our diets. My background is in food science, and what I went to school for is figuring out how do you process food, and there's so many different meanings of what processed can mean, Mm. Um, and there's just such a negative connotation right now around ultra-processed and and figuring out what's, what's processed food, and is processed food bad for me, and I think there's a lot of misconception about what it means to process food and why it can actually be beneficial sometimes. Absolutely. So can you walk me through a little bit about the process of selecting the upcycled ingredients? I know you mentioned oat milk and soy milk, but how did you pick those to get started with? Oh, That's such a good question. I think it's probably a little bit easier to talk about our sourcing and sharing our origin story of our brand. So our founder, Claire Schlemme, founded uh, Boston's first organic juice company. And at the end of the day and juicing, she was left with a whole bunch of pulp. And this pulp was driving her crazy. She didn't know what to do with it. And um, she ended up making friends with someone who ran a tofu company. And she was talking to him about about pulp. And he was like, you think you have a lot of pulp. I have a ton of pulp um, from a similar process within making tofu. So tofu is made out of soy milk. And to make soy milk is uh, pretty similar to making oat milk or even juicing where you're left with the same kind of pulp. So Mm -hmm. she worked on turning that pulp originally into okara flour. And okara flour is not new. This has been pretty prolific within Asian cultures. It's in a pretty key dish called okonomiyaki. Um, And Mm -hmm. so by using that, they were able to better understand kind of the industrial uh, capabilities of this ingredient at a larger scale and really perfecting the drying process. We should probably start with what is upcycling and how does Renewal Mill define upcycling? So upcycling is really the activity of taking something that otherwise would not go to human consumption and make it edible and make it into its own new product. So upcycling is not new. Um, Upcycling is also a verb. So you can list something as being an upcycled product. Yes, that is certainly a qualifying badge we can have on our products and we'll definitely talk about that in a moment. But upcycling is truly an activity. And if we think about upcycling, it's it's pretty natural and we have kind of been doing it our whole lives. It's really about using the most of what we have. If we think about thinking like a chopped chef in our own fridges, that's technically upcycling. Or maybe if you have something that you're not going to wear anymore because it doesn't fit and you... Um, flip it, like thrift flipping, that's technically upcycling as well. And so if you think about using something and giving it a higher value or a higher purpose when previously it would go to waste, that qualifies as upcycling. 
Now, there's a lot of foods that we might not know are upcycled. So whey protein is a really good example of this. Whey protein is like its own thing now, its own almost like commodity within the food system. And Absolutely. this was, yeah, this was a byproduct originally of the dairy industry. So being able to take that byproduct and turn it into something like whey protein isolates are expensive now. Like this is its own very expensive side stream. So ideally you're taking something that would otherwise be uh, waste stream and turning it into a value generating, nutrition dense, delicious food. And I think it's also just like super important to acknowledge as these streams become developed, they might not be seen as upcycled anymore, just as whey protein is. And I don't think that's a loss. Like that's actually what I think should be considered a goal is when you have something that is standing on its own legs, the value is seen within the market and consumers are able to really act on that as well as um, businesses are able to generate from that. And I think it's more of a common practice than people realize. So in the past, it was called co-products. So for example, like a a good one is like cornstarch, right? You have a whole corn kernel. But and there is starch in there, but there's also the germ. There's also the the germ oil. So that's like corn oil. Then you have um, the hull, which is the fiber. And then there's some protein in there. And a lot of that goes to animal feed. And it's, it's been a practice in the food industry for a number of years. But I think it's great that it's starting to become mainstream because and I've been told stories of in the past where it was like a reject um like oh we don't want that dirty water or yeah. we don't want that dirty dirty oil or whatever and it's so great to see it becoming so much more normalized so that it's valuable just like whey protein exactly like you said so I'm I'm glad you brought that up yes it's it's so important to see beauty and value Um, in our food system and like really in our surroundings. I think a lot of it is, and we actually just changed the messaging on the back of our packs to mention that a lot of times wasting less is just about seeing value, beauty, and deliciousness where other people haven't even looked yet. So training your eyes and upcycled food also affects the rest of your life too. If you're able to really see like how much potential lies around us for what we can fully utilize. So it's a mind shift as well. (laughs) Oh, that's beautiful. What's the most surprising upcycled ingredient you've discovered in this space? Oh, okay. You definitely know this because you're a food system person, but the cashew nut, like the fruit around the cashew nut, um, Mm -hmm. that's a really interesting one because I think that a lot of times – you like you think you don't think about a cashew as like the thing hanging from the bottom of the fruit and the more that you really understand the nutrition that's kind of sitting around the nut that we normally eat the more that you're like why have we not done very much with this at all and there is there is a company that's a part of UFA that is doing almost like a jackfruit style kind of like meaty replacement with that oh, cashew wow. nut it's really good i like to add a little bit of salt on there i'll follow up with the brand name but really great vibes from her and she's been doing a lot with that company so that's been a really fun surprising one um that's I, awesome i love the cashew fruit like the actual fruit yeah. itself i ate it when i was uh, traveling a few years ago down in brazil and it is so tasty. Yeah. Like it's it's citrusy. It's bright. They put it in a salad. It's got protein in it. It was just so so good. And I was I felt the same way. I was like, what yeah. what is this? And they were like, oh, that's cashew. And I was like, no, it's not. Yeah. Cashew is the little nut. And they they humbled me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it is it's it's really tasty. And it's it's cool to see it being used in other cuisines and other cultures too. Because there is so much more that we don't know about it. Exactly. Yes. And I think also it's like, and when you see how much of a difference in size it is, it really makes you appreciate the individual cashew too, because the whole fruit kind of took place in in creating that. So yeah, Mm -hmm. makes you think. I like the ones that make you think. Another one was actually what led me to Renewal Mill in the first place was my previous role at Imperfect Foods. And I was there for like three, almost four years. And we put out a number of private label upcycled products. And Mm -hmm. with one of our upcycled chocolate chip cookies, I like tracked these guys down and was like, what is, what is this Okara flour? What is this oat milk flour? And learned a lot about Renew Mill that way. And that's really where I originally fell in love. But, um, 
another product that we had at Imperfect was chocolate covered broken pretzel pieces. And so Mm -hmm. if you think about like the dipped pretzels that you can get like at a normal like CVS or something like that, the factory had a bunch of broken ones that weren't being utilized. And so we were able to convince them to cover those in chocolate as well and sold those in a a big bag and, and they got a ton of love. And it always made me wonder, like, what happens when you max out the supply of broken pretzel pieces in the world? And so that's also <laughs> kind of like one of the big like existential crises of, of upcycling. But it always kind of brings it up of like the supply chains are so different and there's so many unique challenges within upcycling. But if you can kind of like take a step back and be like, this is a cool idea, you can appreciate the cool idea at, at its surface as well. So. Yeah. I mean, and the funny thing is, is like food scientists are always trying to see how we not have so many broken pretzel pieces, which is kind of counterintuitive or counteractive to what you're doing is trying to just valorize that waste stream. So it's it's definitely an interesting dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. It's a balance for sure. <laughs> yeah. But the good news is, you know, the factories are always going to mess up. But whether you like it or not, there's, there's yep. always going to be at some point uh, where it's not going to be the ideal piece of pretzel or whatever you're manufacturing. Yeah. And I mean, I think too, like manufacturing is kind of a funky one because there isn't as much info sharing within manufacturing. So you have a lot of the sustainability folks in the manufacturing world are not like directly incentivized to post their waste numbers for the world to see. And maybe they have zero waste goals that are just uh, landfill avoidance. There's folks at Refed, for instance, that have done an amazing job uh, gathering the data within the manufacturing space, but it really can kind of only go so far. And so we're kind of just now understanding the scale. <laughs> I think it's 40.3 billion in value of manufacturing generated waste at this time. I think it was previously somewhere like 12. So something happened probably in like, and maybe like mandated reporting or something like that. But that's a lot. Yeah, it's 40 million. Yeah, we're kind of just now understanding the scale. (laughs) Yeah, wow. That's still billion, not million. Billion with a B. With a B. Yikes. Yeah. (laughs) Big numbers. Exactly, exactly. Wow. Well, that brings a lot of opportunities for Renewal Mill and lots of other companies in the, the upcycled space. So, I mean, at least at least there's people being proactive about using it. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's the first step is knowing that it's there, right? And I think mm-hmm. like that's been a really cool thing that I've seen just in my time in kind of like mission-focused foods is when I was first getting into this, there was really only just that basic understanding of food is going to waste and that is bad. That was kind of when we Mm -hmm. had some of those first big public facing campaigns, like from the ad council about wasted food. And that was really when Imperfect first came in with on the farm food waste. And so there was Mm -hmm. a lot of consumer education at the larger scale of of consumer, like can, where where consumers can hop in to buy ugly produce or understand where food waste happens on the farm. And so it's like, okay, we are here. But there's also all of these other things that take place. There's also the food waste hierarchy scale, there's composting. And so there's a lot of things for consumers to digest. And I think that Really, it's always about progress, not perfection, understanding a little bit more on both sides, like being able to meet consumers where they are and kind of educate along the way too. Yeah, yeah, because one third of all food produced is wasted, whether that's on the farm, whether that's at the grocery store, the retailer and manufacturing or at home, it's still a huge amount of food um, that that really has nutritional value and, and can be consumed. So um, definitely a lot of opportunity for really everyone to get educated about it. It's a learning curve for sure, but I think it's a good one and a much needed one. Yes, definitely. Totally agree. I know we talked about how the supply is always in question. How do you ensure the quality and the safety just from like a documentation perspective? How do you ensure that it's, you know, meets um, quality every time? Yeah, I think it's It's really about building trust with our manufacturing partners. So Mm -hmm. what is helpful with this is that we're not necessarily sourcing things at the farm level. So we aren't doing farm verification. We're a little bit more at the meeting point of the middle of the supply chain. And so Mm -hmm. 
what that means inherently is that the partners that we work with are doing a lot of this kind of baseline documentation on their own certifications or their own safety audits and things like that. As an ingredient seller, it really means that we have to have our ducks in a row to understand if something has XYZ certification versus other types of certification, where that might come into play. The oat supply chain is a really interesting one because it's it's certainly possible to do gluten-free certified oats. But even as we've seen in some of the big guys like even Quaker, where it's like it's not necessarily easy to build out a pure gluten-free supply chain for that. Um, So it's really about like working hand in hand with our suppliers and being able to understand where do we want to go together? Because they might have, they might have business opportunities for their main product and they have to prioritize that. And so we just make sure that we're working with credible, awesome partners. We love everyone that we work with. They totally share the passion. And even if that is not the main thing that they are selling, they know that we can build a strong partnership with them to get it developed into a really stable supply and get it out the door for something that is high value for everybody. So yeah. our our supply chain is also a little bit different too because these raw materials, given that they would otherwise go to waste, they don't necessarily have a price tag on them, right? So we're really working with our partners to determine the value of that. A lot of times we're having to go back and really clearly explain what the ingredient is because it's brand new. So that's also a factor as well. But I think kind of to sum it up, it's just making sure we have really trusted manufacturing partners that have all of their ducks in a row and then in facing the consumer and then also facing our ingredient customers, being able to pass that on transparently to show them that we are up to spec with everything too. Something that I hear a lot from our founder, Claire, is how interesting it is to be in kind of a pristine, untouched food source. There's a big tendency right now, especially within media, to have kind of like clickbaity articles or even like titles of different things that allude to a trash to treasure narrative. For us, it's really the opposite. And for really every other upcycled brand, I know it truly is the opposite. Because if you're going to be upcycling from within the manufacturing industry, You are working with the cleanest facilities ever because they're already producing food that we eat every day. So the side streams, waste streams, waste does not necessarily mean dirty. There Mm -hmm. is no food waste, only wasted food. So we are really touching like pristine premium sources of nutrition that we're able to work with um, in this manufacturing process. I I love that you added that part about the food manufacturing facilities being pristine because I've, I've stepped in plenty of manufacturing facilities and the the level of cleanliness that food facilities need to go through in order to get their food up to scale is really insane. From just the manufacturing point of view, you need to have, they call it a critical control point. So you need to have a couple different critical control points to make sure your food is to the point where it's processed enough um, because there's so many opportunities for food contamination and foodborne illness. So I think it's so important I love that what you said, that there is no such thing as food waste, just wasted food, because I think that that wraps it up perfectly. There's so much manufacturing waste that's really untapped potential for you, but also, you know, sad (laughs) at the end of the day, too. (laughs) The main questions that we're getting now, I feel really heartened to know that we're getting, is this delicious, a lot more often than is this safe? And that's Great. That's a big win for for us and for upcycling because it's easier to explain to somebody what this is if they're willing to try it than having to answer more basic questions prior. And we also saw this um, in a parallel path at Imperfect Foods where Mm -hmm. um, previously people would ask like, all right, so you're delivering ugly produce. Is it rotten? And instead of doing that, it was more so, oh, yeah, like funky shapes, like scarring, like those kind of things happen. And so just like basic consumer understanding of that. And again, like so much of this is just meeting people where they are and getting the same understanding of of what you're eating and what you're looking at. So you can continue to have really fun conversations and really start to riff off of that um, and get people really excited about new things. So like it's it's a good kind of hand holding because not everybody comes from the food space to know all of the ins and outs, um, mm-hmm. whether it be manufacturing. I don't have a 
a super strong manufacturing background. I also um, didn't grow up on a produce farm. So like not very many people have comparatively. So um, right. it's good to have those conversations, even if we're super in the weeds to know like the 101 is super important here because everybody deserves to to understand the food that they're eating. Yeah. And I don't know if you were on the sales and marketing side at Imperfect, but they had some of the best messaging around food waste and like exactly to your point, like this isn't, this is just ugly. It's not, it just didn't meet cosmetic standards. And I thought that they did an incredible job messaging that and really helping people understand the value. And it was all in the name. It was just imperfect. It wasn't bad. Yeah. And we've, we've pulled a lot of that ethos into our messaging here um, Mm -hmm. and really helping understand um, like the food system. And so um, really something that I, that I take in almost like and everything that we talk about on the upcycled side is, is really four things. So how can this be upcycled? And like, what makes this cookie upcycled? And the first piece of this is that this is coming from a very premium, delicious thing. So you think about oat milk. Mm-hmm. What is the fanciest, most expensive, treat yourself, frothy oat milk that you would get? This is what we are pulling from. So this is this is the very high quality thing in the beginning. The reason why this protein and fiber was not on your plate already previously is because there wasn't a market for it previously. In a lot of ways, we've invented the processes and the applications for these ingredients. So that's why you never had it yet. There isn't a market for it. Um, mm-hmm. The process for working within Upcycled is super, super exciting. Upcycling as a verb is a ton of fun and a very worthy activity. And we're very innovative within the process. So really talking about kind of the excitement within. Um, And then the fourth piece, but really just looking at the bigger picture and knowing there is so much more that we can do within the food system. And then beyond the food system, how much this impacts things like methane emissions or carbon dioxide emissions or our water use. You can think about the labor and the land and all of the different things that go into making the food that we eat. And so that's really the big halo of like, this is so much bigger than you and me and what's on our plates. This has to do with everybody. And so if you can kind of wrap that around in like a big hug of information and give kind of that glow halo, there's so many different ways to do that end part. Some people like to lead with the climate messaging or or even the water messaging or labor messaging of supporting farmers and things like that. For mm-hmm. us, we really love to talk about that first part of like how good the protein and fiber is and like how delicious this is and where it's coming from and more of the activity part. I think as we are able to like mature in our messaging, we'll be able to really get that that hug at the end down. But that's kind of where we sit. And the way that we look at that and the way that we kind of structure that messaging so intensely comes directly from Imperfect. Um, Riley Brock, who was the chief storyteller over at Imperfect, really kind of wrote the the rule book that I still very much personally follow within upcycling and some of kind of like the the bold stances that we've taken within upcycling that he's helped articulate over here as well for us. So very, very thankful for Riley. He's done some really fantastic work for sustainability brands and just getting that value prop across. Yeah, that's awesome. I wasn't aware, but that's super nice feather on the cap for Riley for sure. Yeah, yeah. You'd love him. He's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe we can we can have him on the show. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I know you talked about, you know, there's kind of a, a cohort, right, um, so to speak, of people or companies in the upcycled food space, and there is an upcycled foods association. Mm-hmm. Can you talk to me a little bit about what that looks like? Before I started with Renewal Mill, our co-founder, Caroline Cotto, actually co-founded the Upcycled Food Association. So our brand has been very involved in UFA since the very beginning. And what UFA has done is they've taken this concept of upcycled food and made it a source of community and a source of structure to be able to understand and really pursue that kind of feather in the cap for for products that are doing that really important work. So it's really a collective of not only food brands, but also researchers, students, folks at larger food companies that are maybe looking to source upcycled ingredients. One member of UFA is Dole Specialty Ingredients, and we actually source our pineapple 
fiber and our green banana fiber from them. And yeah, they've been able to do some really awesome work within upcycled foods, just utilizing their own supply chains and making new and unique ingredients from that. So some of the big guys are really wanting to get involved. We also have smaller brands that really are passionate about one specific area, much like we are. And and Upcycled gives them the opportunities to showcase at like a larger stage, whether that be at Fancy Food Show in New York or maybe Expo, to be able to have a supportive body that can connect you to the right people and put you in the right rooms has been really, really beneficial for a lot of these Upcycled brands. We're all dealing with a lot of the same challenges, whether it be supply chain or messaging or just some of the the big pieces of being a consumer facing food brand. Everybody's going through it together. And so that's where I think Upcycled Food Association has provided a ton of value for those involved. The last piece, which has become a lot more prevalent, is um, policy involvement. So if we look at some of these like traditional folks that are involved in food policy, whether it be the farm bill or kind of like other categorization of involvements within the government. Upcycled hasn't had a super strong voice previously, but the Mm -hmm. UFA just as a, as a general group has been doing some really exciting work within policy, whether it be putting together like drafted letters for, for farm bill inclusions or even commenting on some of the general recommendations from Harvard Food Law and Policy Board or NRDC. Whenever these things come out, there are these really, really long documents that kind of dictate like the priorities of the different organizations. And now the upcycle has become more prevalent, it's getting mentioned more and more in these larger documents. And so Even though we don't necessarily have like a full-time person that's hanging out in D.C. all the time, we are able to make these very official comments so that Upcycled is being able to be featured more highly within some of these kind of policies and review. I think a really big win recently that I, I do think is pretty directly related to UFA's work in this space is that Upcycled is now listed distinctly within the food waste hierarchy that we use at the U.S. government level. So previously it was eating, donating, and then it would go down from there. And now it is eating, upcycling, or donating, and then it goes down from there. And so being able to be featured within that hierarchy and so high up is a really, really big win for Upcycled as well. And I know that there's been just a ton of effort in that space from the folks involved. So um, I think that is totally a testament of having really smart and just like dedicated, passionate people involved in the group. So yeah, and awareness. I mean, I remember yeah. when I first got involved in the food waste space was back in grad school. I wrote a whole paper on, you know, that's that's kind of how my interest started in the space was, you know, like the FAO came out and said, you know, one one third of all food is wasted. And I, I started a paper on it and I didn't realize how much of a rabbit hole there was, you know, food waste, food loss, and then the food hierarchy. And they've since changed it from a triangle. Now, I think it's like a, they call it a wave yeah. because they wanted to express that it doesn't matter how it's It does matter at the end of the day, but like as long as it's not being diverted to landfill, that's ultimately the goal at the end of the day, which I think is a really much different way of looking at things than we're used to. Oh, definitely. And that will take time to percolate as well, but it'll Mm -hmm. be really cool to see that unfold. And it's cool that we're some of the the first people that are able to really look at it and talk about it and kind of digest it ourselves. So yeah. And be like, Hey, that's me. I did that. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Cool. So in your opinion, How can upcycled food create a more sustainable food system? I think upcycled is such a fun movement because it's focusing on what we already have. And Mm -hmm. if we look at general consumer movements, there's such a push to like buy, buy, buy and use, use, use. And Mm -hmm. what I say a lot about our impact is that it grows along with us. So being an inherently circular product means that you can and should grow because your impact is going to grow to impact the food system. We are spoiled with our supply chain because it is virtually endless. As the plant-based milk market grows, which it continues to do, this waste stream will continue to grow. And so how can we come up with more ways to utilize this valuable protein and fiber um, and kind of bring it to it um, its highest possible outcome within the food system? So it's really about using everything and using the different odds and ends. A lot of our brand is really focused around using everything rather than rescuing something that's being wasted Um, Mm -hmm. because it 
it's a lot more logical within the food space. We also see, of course, a really good connotation in other industries as well that we can kind of align ourselves to with. Like fashion is a really big one right now. If we think about the kind of the rise of like shopping secondhand or like I mentioned earlier with thrift flipping. So being able to look to under indus- other industries and saying like, how are they marketing that? Like, why is this a movement is really, really cool to think about. And so we have to understand our food system enough to know where we can impact it. And that that's, goes back to that baseline understanding. But in order to get that essence across without having to like, this is what the supply chain looks like with, without having to, to really roll all of that out, it's it's very helpful to think about upcycling as kind of like how our grandmas, if, if your grandma ever had uh, cool up containers as Tupperware containers. Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. That is, that <laughs> Every is kind. Vibe. That is the vibe. Or the, the, tin, the tin cookies that never actually had cookies in them. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, that is what we are doing here. We are using everything in the cabinet. We're using everything in the food system. And what a joy it is to figure out unique ways to use something. And so I think that's really how – we, we view the system as being just a little bit more digestible for us. Yeah. That brings me to my next question is, what's your favorite unconventional way to use Renewal Mills products or the most creative way you've heard about people using them? I really like one of our ingredient buyers, Tia Lupita. They make tortillas. A lot of our foods, we tend to go towards the dessert and kind of like the, the baking category and Tia Lupita tortillas are incredible. They use our Okara flour and they're just so wonderful to work with and have the, they have our logo on pack, which is really exciting. And just like quality of product is, is totally there and just really, really good experience as a upcycled tortilla. So very thankful to be involved there. And, and it's nice to have a savory side as well. I think that's going to be a really fun area to explore down the road. Although it also feels like we've barely even touched baking. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just starting to scratch the surface yes. in a bunch of areas. Yeah, we're still developing the the products themselves because they're brand new. So being a gluten free product comes with inherent challenges as well. And so it's really just been Absolutely. kind of a matter of bringing out the best in the ingredients as they've been developed themselves. I got uh, just a couple more questions for you here. What's something you wish more people knew about in the world of food sustainability, either about upcycling or or just about food sustainability in general? I think within food sustainability, it's important to know that because everybody eats, we are all a part of our food system. And so Mm -hmm. someone that I worked with for a long time, Jeannie Foles, she would always say, and what else do we have the chance to make a vote every day towards a good team. And eating is the perfect example. We have three opportunities every day to make a choice that benefits the planet, benefits folks that are putting their lives and their effort and their water and their labor hours. And you make a choice three times a day. And that's that's a really daunting thing. If you want to think about it that way, it's also a very simple thing. You always are able to start over with the next meal or kind of like deepen your impact there. And again, it's, it's all about just making progress and not not perfection with this too. And, and just understanding a little bit more as you go. So we're all a part of it and we can all make a difference, but it doesn't have to be a a huge, crazy thing. It can be really small things three times a day. So. I really like that. I think that's really powerful. I always say on, on the blog, your plate holds more power than you think. Absolutely. Um, That's a great way to put it. For sure. Yeah. I, and I love the the opportunity three times a day, you have the, the choice to make an impact. And I was at Expo West a couple of weeks back and somebody said, you know, vote with your dollar, mm-hmm. show your support with your dollar. And I know that's, you know, easier said than done for a lot of people, but it just proves the power of choice. You don't always have to spend the most amount of money to choose a more sustainable option. Oh yeah, for sure. I think as we like grow to, to better understand the options out there and, and it can be very taste driven too, like making an impact can be delicious at the end of the day. So. Oh, I love that. That's a great way to to phrase it. And then last thing for you, is there anything else you'd like to add about, you know, Renewal Mills upcycle philosophy or your mission that we haven't talked about? Ultimately, as we think about our mission and, and reducing food waste, we have to be ridiculously creative with neglected ingredients. As more people get involved and 
ideally these upcycled foods become normal foods, just like whey protein and other things, we can really start to think about how can we continue to drive innovation within our food system, whether it be through different protein applications or fiber applications. At the end of the day, we might be sitting on something that could be designated as protein rather than flour. And what does that entail for the product? Mm -hmm. Um, And then also too, like a rising tide lifts all ships. So being an ingredient provider, we're agnostic to who is going to use our product, even if they're in the same category, because we want to make sure that this ingredient sees the light of day and becomes as popular as possible um, because it holds so much potential in itself too. So choosing our partners and really thinking about our growth very intentionally of of the ingredient, supporting that at all costs, because that's how we're going to be making the, the biggest impact is super important to us as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Lydia, for for coming on today and really appreciate our conversation and learning a lot more about Renewal Mill and your process with the upcycle journey. So thank you so much. Of course. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And that's it for today's episode with Lydia from Renewal Mill. I'm so happy I got to have this conversation with her. It was so eye-opening and informative, and I learned so much about how sourcing upcycled ingredients work, and I thought it was a really interesting topic. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's episode as much as I did, and don't forget to check out Renewal Mill products listed in the show notes below. If you want to find more sustainable brands, don't forget to look at our sustainable brands page on madetosustain.com and make sure you follow along and subscribe so you can hear more from other food sustainability brands this season. Don't forget to leave us a review. Thanks so much for listening and hope to see you back again next week. Thanks. Bye.